<clears throat> so just like us wildlife can feel under the weather, they can get sick, they can get diseases. What diseases and illnesses are common or found in animals and how do those diseases affect our wildlife populations or even our own human health? Tonight, we're gonna dive into that, nerd out about that with some two pretty excellent speakers that I'll have Monica introduce. Yeah, so if, like Amber said, if you've never been on before, um, my name is Monica McCubrey and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission out of the Lincoln office. I'll let Amber introduce herself. Amber Schultz, Assistant Division Administrator with the Fish and Wildlife Education Division at Game and Parks as well. Awesome. Well, um, you've heard from us, and if you've joined us before, like Amber said, welcome back. If you haven't, um, welcome for the first time. Um, so Amber said we're going to have two amazing biologists and just kind of talking to them before we actually hit record here. We had some really great, icky, interesting, like so many adjective type conversations. So um, first person that we're going to have is Sean Dunn tonight. Um, if you're a nature nerd regular, you've probably seen him on at least five or six times. He is a wealth of knowledge. He is our zoologist, uh, natural heritage zoologist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And then we also have um, a new person we've never had on before. Uh, this is Jody Green, and she is actually an extension educator um, slash urban entomologist. So um, she's with the Nebraska Extension in Dar Douglas and Sarpy County. So um, we're going to have some fun nerding out tonight about some wildlife diseases. So, yeah. All right. Are we ready to get started? And Sean, right away. I, I have a question that I think is, is important because I run into a lot of people that call me for questions and I, I always tell them, have you talked to extension? And a lot of people don't know what extension is. So can I have mm -hmm. Jody just explain what extension is? Because it is a fabulous source of information that some people just don't know about. I like yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. We're the like, so I'm employed by the university, but I am the arm that goes between the research and everything that's being done in different universities and then the public. So yeah. it's it's bringing things to, to like all the research and all the knowledge to make it applicable to the communities. And I'm an entomologist. We have an entomology department at UNL, but I'm in Douglas and Sarpy County. So I am right in the community where people can call me and it's and walk in with bugs to, to have identified. I do talks for like school nurses and different like libraries or things like that. And it's a free service because, and we are just helping people make better decisions. And it's all like, I'm unbiased. I can't give recommendations for pest control companies, but I can tell you what bug that is and mm -hmm. how it works. So Excellent. yeah, a lot of times Good your service. Yeah, people's grandparents know about us because it was more of an ag thing, bringing the research to the farmers. Um, but I'm an urban entomologist. And so a lot of grandparents will tell their grandkids like, you should call extension. Excellent. So I don't know, every, I was, every county I has found, one. Yeah, I always found the most amazing stuff from like university extensions. Like you want to know about like how to can, can things properly. You want to talk, know about like making quilts. Uh, you want to learn about wildlife, like any topic you can think of, like extension practically has it covered. I mean, it's, it's really cool. Right. When I first started working for Extension, I was like, is this like a call your mom service? Because people would call and be like, how do I get the stain out of this? Like, how long should I cook my turkey? This was on my counter. Should I still eat it? And I'm like, what kind of place do I work at? <laughs> I feel and like Amber and I and Sean all kind of feel like that too. Like, it's mm -hmm. it, yeah, definitely like, where do you work? So you get um, um, uh, this is I good. And I feel like this leads us right into you know, our first question is, it's Nature Nerd Night. We're here to nerd out and we're excited about it. Um, nerds are welcome. So tell us kind of maybe Jody or Sean, whoever wants to start first, what made you a nature nerd? What kind of brought you to this space? Hmm. Um, man, I was, I, I think I was, you know, just from the beginning uh, growing up, you know, I was the kid bringing anything I found outside, inside. I was the one digging in the dirt in the backyard. Um, I've always had a love for the outdoors and, and for insects and mammals and herps. And uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of a generalist when it comes to, to my job with Game and Parks. Um, Monica said, you know, I'm the zoologist for the state. So I 
try to keep track of our populations of perps and small mammals and insects and which is great because I love doing all of those different things. And so um, I, I just always grew up doing this stuff and stuck with it through my first volunteer jobs, my first actual jobs. They were all involved in uh, wildlife one way or another. Um, not always. I had plenty of other jobs that had nothing to do with wildlife. Um, but, you know, you got to pay the bills, too, while you go to school. So. But I always fell back to it, always outside, always, um, you know, looking for the next adventure, uh, dealing with the outdoors and, and science. So, Sean, can I add something to yours? I don't know if it's yeah. protocol. Something that I admire so much about you is even if it, even if wildlife wasn't your topic, you know, you are one of the most curious people that I know. And I know that I can come to you with a curious random question. And instead of judging me or like wait why are you asking that you just dive right into the rabbit hole with me and I appreciate that so much so I would say also your curiosity not to, thank you not to tell you your own experience but anyways okay. <laughs> that's, Jody. that's quite all right yeah. yeah no I um yeah that I I I have to agree with you there I am very curious I don't think there's a question that somebody can bring to me that I would just pass off like I'm always like well yeah that is a good question you should figure that out so. Yeah. Also, I love your book recommendations. I'm going to put that in too, because every time we talk about something, it's like, well, there's a book you could read about this, like anything like rabies to like, you know, animals and moths and like the zebra ulcer one. That one was good. So. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All Jody, right. What about you? Yeah. Um, probably the same thing is that I'm curious, but the problem with that is, is that there's just not enough hours in the day at all to figure everything out. So like sleeping and eating and probably those things go go away mm -hmm. and I just spend more time like um trying to figure out problems and uh rear things out like when people are like oh this is what it probably is I'm like well it could be let's rear it out so like I have containers mm -hmm. all over with things developing or you know like <laughs> what happens like when people bring me bed bugs I just leave them there and then when it's like how long do they live without a blood meal I'm like hold on you know I'm like well this one lived three <laughs> minutes you know, wow. um, and actually the first time I met you, Amber, was I was just going to say SRAM, the first time I met you. Yeah, it was. So at the SRAM Education Center it was brand new and you had mm -hmm. the, the ironwood mm -hmm. um, decorative poles there. But people were going nuts because things were flying around and landing on people <laughs> and there were bugs. And I was like, this is amazing. What's happening? Which and I was the out problem. there looking and then you came and it was right. like, I've never met you before. We were just nerding out before we right. introduced ourselves. It was amazing. And I reached in to a tiny little hole with, with a, like tweezers like this and pulled out like a wood boring beetle from by its head. It was the most satisfying thing. It's probably like popping a zit, but better. <laughs> and um, there were these uh, redheaded ash borers, but also flying all over were parasitic wasps. So it was like the oh. circle of life happening in and people were freaking out. And it's it was amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. And and then that's how we met. Yep, I love it. <laughs> that's so great. What about um <clears throat> how did you either of you become interested in wildlife disease? I know that you don't that's not solely what you both do, but it's kind of adjacent to some of the things you work on. So how would you what would you say about that? Well, most of my work is with arthropods, so, you know, insects and and ticks and things like that. So mosquitoes and ticks are vectors of some of these zoonotic diseases. So that's how it relates. And I really deal with probably more people. Like I always say like the bugs are pretty easy. It's the people and the social aspect of the things that I, I work with um, to figure things out and help people. So that's how I got involved. And since everything's connected, you know, wildlife is, is part of that system. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I've worked in, in, with again, several different taxa working in and out, you know, very remote areas, but also areas and, you know, more urban. And the transfer of diseases is just something that um, happens. And it's good to be knowledgeable about that, not only because people have questions about it, but a lot of times, um, and I recommend this to other biologists too, is that, um, you know, as biologists, we're exposed to a lot more of these zoonoses than most people. 
And so when you go in to the doctor not feeling well, you've got to be able to explain like, hey, I was handling small mammals the other day, so you should check me for A, B, and C, you know, Hanta or whatever else it may be. And so part of it is just understanding what you're doing to maintain, you know, a safe working environment. But then also, you know, when you start getting into wildlife populations and disease, um, density dependent diseases, you've got to know what's affecting these populations mm -hmm. so that if you see a sudden downturn, you can say, okay, it may be increased predation or it could be a disease. Like what kind of disease would we expect here? So it, it's absolutely not what I do, um, but it's a part of that. And I just find it fascinating. Um, some of these diseases, you know, I'm sure we'll touch on rabies. It's a horrible, horrible disease, but the virus is fascinating. Like mm. the way it infects, the way it moves, like it's just incredibly fascinating, but, um, but terrible for humans. So both of you have mentioned the term zoonosis or zoonotic diseases. And Sean, I know you mentioned earlier before we turned the cameras on here that it kind of depends on how we define that, whether you are a medical doctor or a veterinarian or a biologist. So could both of you maybe talk a little bit about the definition of zoonotic diseases or a disease like that? Yeah, I mean, and... And it, it gets into some of the terminology because, um, you know, we'll talk about like vectors, you know, which are usually not always the arthropods that will carry uh, a disease, whether it's a bacteria or a virus, a fungus from one organism to a next. But um, yeah, very, very broadly, I would say uh, zoonosis is a disease that goes from that infects animals but then can also infect humans. Mm -hmm. And that is very general. There's lots of uh, little tidbits of that that we could pick apart depending on what we wanna do, but that's how I would describe it. Something that normally infects animals, but can also infect humans. Are there different types of zoonotic diseases? Like, are they categorized? Like sometimes in um, readings and papers, you th see things that are like, parasitic or viral or fungal, bacterial? Um, yeah. Is there any, are those kind of just broad categories or is there any other way that you would describe the different types of them? And Jody, feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, yeah I think I, you, you covered most of them, right? Like some of them are gonna be parasites and some of them are bacteria, viruses. So like, I think you covered all those and then they can be transmitted in different ways. And sometimes mm -hmm. like, sometimes it needs a vector, but other times it could be like direct or indirect based on like bedding or food or feces, urine, different, different things like that. Then there's also like foodborne um, diseases as well. So you both mentioned vector and just to be super clear, a host in this kind of cycle of a zoonotic disease is where the disease originates from or it's also where whoever is infected, but a vector can hold the disease, but then give it to some to another species. Is that true? Right. Yeah. So the vector is a like a living organism that can transmit the infectious agent. And I don't think, and it has to like live long enough to be able to, to transfer it. And so there's, it's actually very, I guess, not, you know, it's very specific. So not all, like let's say even mosquitoes or, you know, one of the, it, it is the most deadly animal, but not all spe of the same species will be able to transmit the same pathogen. So not all of them are vectors, right? So um, it, it actually takes quite an interesting set of, I guess, factors for something to be a really good vector. That's a- and Okay. Can I share my screen real quick? Yeah, yeah. You I've should. got I've got a slide here that um, I will just share briefly. Um, all right, are you seeing my my slide here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So uh, this one just shows. Um, are you seeing my notes or my actual slide? Um, we see the next slide and then the one you're on. But oh, no. okay. Let's see here. I was trying to get the other one back, but. Okay, so this one here, um, you know, this shows uh, what's called Hendra virus, which was down in Australia. 
It's um, deadly to horses for the most part and humans. The primary vector is bats, um, but secondary vectors can also be uh, other mammals that get infected with this. And again, this is very generalized, but it, again, depending on whether you're a veterinarian or a human doctor um, or a, a biologist, wildlife biologist, um, it, it really depends on the terminology that you want to look at. But in this case, the, you've got different levels of vectors that can transmit this virus to different hosts. And it's not really, the virus isn't really meant to be in horses or humans. And so it actually ends up taking over um, and then it's got quite a lethal um, um, ability to horses and, and humans, unfortunately. So, Sean, how does that, how does the bats like transmit it to the others? Is it? Yeah. Through? So it was really interesting. Um, there's um, a case that was done. So I read about um, one of the um, outbreaks of this in um, a book called Spillover by David Quammen. And he talks about this and what was happening was the fruit bats were roosting in trees uh, that the horses were shading under. And then their feces and things were dropping down in the horses or nearby. The horses I believe were either drinking infected water or inhaling um, parts of the droppings and things. And that's how they became infected. You, you mentioned something that just made me kind of curious. You said that the virus evol you know, evolved in the bat. And mm -hmm. so when I'm thinking about a virus, um, you know, it's, it's a scary topic, but also if you think from a virus's perspective, they don't really want to kill the host right away because they're kind of like using that host to live. And so right. that virus evolved in a bat. And is that the big threat of zoonotic diseases when it actually does jump because it wasn't, it didn't evolve, like, for example, in that horse. And that's why it was so detrimental. Is that like a component of why zoonotic diseases can be I guess so dangerous is because it wasn't, it didn't evolve for that system. And so that system is like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Shut it down. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would tend to think so because that's, and that's another thing that we talk about when we talk about zoonosis is, which is a reservoir. So that's where you would typically find the disease or, you know, the virus, the bacteria, whatever it may be. And it tends to survive there without negatively impacting mm. that species very much. And so, yeah, when it jumps to a new species, you never know how it's going to act. And so, yeah, a lot of times when these things jump to humans, uh, it can be really bad or it may be nothing. It may mm. be something that our uh, immune system is able to fight off fairly okay. easily. Gotcha. Looking at some of these vectors and hosts, are there some real, I don't want to call them MVPs, but are there like some um, arthropods? Are there some mammals that are very um, commonly used? Like the slide that you just showed us. I know a lot of bats are, um, are there a lot of like ticks and stuff too? Are there some real animals that are just like, they usually carry them or usually the host or the vectors? The heavy hitters of the zoonosis. Well, I could speak for like the, maybe the arthropod vectors, like it's going to be ticks and mosquitoes, but there's also fleas and flies and sometimes like the body louse. Mm. But, um, but I think with, I don't know. I mean, Sean would know about the animals. I would think a lot of like livestock maybe, and even like urban wildlife and pets. Is that true? I, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I was thinking about this earlier about like, is there a group that carries, you know, more than other things? And it's usually arthropods because I, and I was trying to think of like, why is that? And it's things that are small. Mm -hmm. uh, it's things that move around a lot. Mm -hmm. And so when you start looking at arthropods, obviously fleas are moved around all the time on small mammals. They jump from place to place quite a bit. Uh, ticks obviously uh, are multi generational and move from um, host to host quite a time, quite a few times. Mosquitoes, is, I mean, that's a great one because they're feeding on not only humans but other mammals, mm -hmm. wildlife mammals, and back and forth quite a bit. Um, bats get brought up a lot, and they they do carry 
a, quite a few diseases, but it's, um, I don't know if I would call bats heavy hitters. I think the problem with the bat diseases are when they get to humans, it's usually pretty bad. Mm. Um, and why yeah. that is, I don't know, but it may be that it's just more difficult for, um, uh, or we'll see now I'm thinking it's, I'm going to change my answer midway, but maybe <laughs> it has something to do with their, you know, if it's infecting a bat and it's going to a human, it's mammal to mammal transmission. Right. So it's already, it's already got some, yeah, buildup to, uh, infect mammals. So, yeah, I don't know, but I would definitely say insects and, and arthropods in general are, would it be sound, the, the it biggest like carriers. It sounds like it's less of the biology of the individual species and more of their life history and their interaction with spaces and with other species like mosquitoes and ticks jody in their life history it requires them to you know feed on multiple different species and then that's like just an easy transfer is that kind of why sometimes so um so for something to be a good vector it needs to be able to acquire that illness or pathogen and then, and it has to acquire it where, where it is. So there's that, and then it has to maintain it. So it replicates it and it keeps it in that, that body and that system and then be able to transmit. So, I mean, I deal with bed bugs every day and they, as far as we know, cannot transmit diseases from, you know, to humans. And it's just there, I mean, they can harbor things when scientists put, you know, pathogens inside them, they can wow. harbor those, but they're not able to acquire it or they're not able to transmit it. So wow. even if, you know, when there's always research that says, oh, you know, it's been found that these, you know, whatever's can harbor this, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is going to transmit it or vector it. It does, you know, it's, yeah, it can be in there, but it, it's kind of like when Zika was a, a big thing here because they were finding cases and they were all travel cases. And, you know, in some places, like Florida, Southern Florida, that you can have Zika. But here, like we just don't naturally have that occurring. So the mosquitoes mm. are not, and those species may not be here in the populations, mm. you know? So it's all of these things have to come together to make it able to be a really good vector. And I think it's called like vectorial capacity. So it has to do with like the location, the climate, um, the entomology, the biology, behavior, ecology, all of those things. And then, um, you know, this disease and condition. So, um, you know, some things, it's even like the kissing bug, which is another mm. disease. Um, in some places, you know, geographically, it's gonna be uh, more common. People, more people may be sick because they sleep with their doors and windows open, or they don't have doors and windows. And that, um, you know, Chagas is pretty prevalent there and they have these kissing bugs. Whereas we may have some kissing bugs here, but maybe it's not going to get in our house because we do, we have doors or windows and maybe that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the trypanosome aren't here, you know? So it's all these things have to be put together. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have found kissing bugs here. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean we're going to have a major outbreak. Right. So we've mentioned things like Chagas and Zika and rabies. What are some zoonotic diseases, um, at least in Nebraska, that we, I don't want to scare people and say we need to be scared of them, but are things that we need to be aware of? What do we have here in Nebraska that we see commonly or hear about commonly? You know, West one we've meant, oh, go ahead, Jody. <laughs> well, I was going to say West Nile virus. But then you go on. I can get well, that. <laughs> and I was going to say we've already mentioned rabies. Rabies is one that um, you know you should be aware of. Definitely, uh, the incidence of rabies is extremely low, though. Um, but going and that brings up an interesting point. What Jody was talking about earlier with um, capacity for uh, a good vector, and it made me think of you know any mammal can carry rabies and transmit rabies. Mm. However, possums are really, really good at fighting off rabies. So if you give, uh, if a, a possum gets rabies, gets bitten by something, a rabbit, whatever, raccoon or something, they actually tend to survive and fight off the virus and mm. very, very likely would not pass it on to any other animals. So Possums have this amazing ability for some reason, whatever it may be, we don't know, 
that um, that they don't pass on rabies as much as other things. Now, raccoons, dogs, squirrels, any of those other things, high capacity that if they're bit by a rabid animal, they are going to develop the disease and pass it on. But it's really not that prevalent. You should be aware, but um, nothing to worry about necessarily. A, di a question did, did just pop up about can mm -hmm. squirrels give rabies to dogs? And what I'm hearing is any mammal can get it besides the awesome possum, awesome possum. Yeah, um, they, they absolutely can give it to dogs. Now, the vaccines we have for rabies are really, really effective. So, um, but if there is uh, a concern that a dog was bitten by a rabid squirrel, you should definitely talk to your vet about that. Um, okay, so rabies. Okay. No. Yeah. What about, it. do you want to speak more to West Nile too? Someone asked about that as well. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, so for in Nebraska, I think it was uh, 2018, we had a really, we, our Nebraska had the highest incidence um, of all the states for West Nile virus, and we had the second most deaths behind oh. Illinois. Yeah, and um, that's spread by mosquito. Here's my puppet. <laughs> um, Look at that. And yeah, and if you're like me, you're like a mosquito magnet, and uh, you know, there's a lot of papers that say why some people Mm -hmm. are more attractive to mosquitoes. I think I'm a heavy breather and I probably have like my microbiome and my genetics just to make me more attractive to mosquitoes. So I try not to feel bad about it, protect myself, <laughs> but I did have West Nile virus that same year. Oh, no. um, yeah. And I didn't, I was one of the, like, I think eight out of 10 people who have West Nile virus actually don't have any symptoms. So that's, you know, another thing, but um I think it's something that we have to be aware of because it's the Culex mosquito, which is one of our main mosquitoes here in Nebraska. Mm. And it really does um, have to do with sometimes it, it, it's actually follows drought years. Oh, so, but um, this year, I think I looked at the map. We're, we're doing okay this year. There's, it's a very low incidence, but um, you know, in some years it's been pretty high and so it's something that, to be aware of and mosquitoes are out there right now you know so yeah for sure i'll say another one that um we the more we learn about i think we see there's more wildlife but also it's in our um companion animals quite a bit which is toxoplasmosis so this is one you get a lot from cats and there's some really interesting research on the effects. So it's, it's a, a, a little parasite um, that you get, it's usually shed in the feces of uh, mammals, especially cats. And the way it can affect behavior in they believe not only humans, but in rats and other things, really, really interesting. Um, but that's one that is here. It's, <laughs> I wouldn't call it, common but it's not uncommon and Does it make especially them fearless for, doesn't it make the mice fearless to cats yeah they're it, like it all brave makes, and they go up and then then they get eaten because, yeah because it wants to be in the cat's belly right exactly so does yep. it make and, humans like extra affectionate to cats because like i know some friends highly suspect i'm just saying they they actually think that um that it does change human behavior and in fact there are some studies that link it to um Somebody help me here. There's uh, a oh, is it um, something with pregnant women? Well, pregnant women are very susceptible because the parasite can infect the fetus, and so they're always saying be very careful um, if if you're pregnant. Like when my wife was pregnant with our kids, I just took over doing um, kitty litter duty and all of that. But I can't remember what it is now. But there is a um, it, it's a mental disorder in humans that they're actually finding. If you've been infected with toxoplasmosis in the past, you're much more likely to, to have this. And I can't think of what it is off the top of my head, but interesting. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, all sorts of really fascinating. But um, um again, is it as long as you're careful, you don't have anything to worry about. What's that? Is it the encephalitis? Is that your nope? Maybe no, not. it's okay. it's um I Google I did not remember. help me. 
I'm going to have to look at it. I'm going to have to look it up. So, okay. But, so, but like West Nile, there are several other encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis and, you know, several others that, um, you know, we're becoming more aware of. And, and especially when we talk about viruses and ticks, we are finding all sorts of new ones like bourbon virus, heartland virus, um, the alpha gal, which isn't a virus, but it, I, I don't know, Jody, can you, you could probably explain alpha gal better than me. Yeah, that, that one's really cool. Well, it's like, is it, is it the sugar, is it a sugar? Yeah. I want to say it's a protein. It's, it is very, it's very interesting because that is more like that's in the tick saliva. So mm -hmm. unlike the viruses or bacteria, it doesn't have to like, it doesn't have to be attached for 24, 36 hours. Mm -hmm. It could be it, like 15 minutes. Because it can lick you saliva. is what it sounds like. It can what? It can just lick you and it, you're yeah, done. Kinda. <laughs> great. That's great. Yeah. Oh my so, God. Yeah, sorry, you were saying the, the alpha gal galactose is the sugar, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so okay. yeah, so it's it what happens is that after you get bit by, and they say it's the lone star tick, so it's mm. a certain type of tick. I don't Do know. Do you have any like tick time. demonstrations, for example, with you? Um, well, so they're all really small, so you wouldn't be able to see them, but this is my um I bought these off of the internet this is uh the nice. female adult lone star tick because it's got okay. the, the little white mark in the middle of the adult but um it, they are thinking now scientists that the lone star tick is probably one that like it's so widespread um across um, the u.s from like east to maybe the middle of nebraska for sure um but when you get bit by a tick that has this alpha gal you may develop this severe, sometimes red meat allergy. And that's because anytime you're eating the red meat, so it's not like fish or chicken, it, it want, your body wants to attack it. So it's like the only thing, like for allergies, usually you develop it as a child, but it's like, it's a, this onset, but it's a delayed onset. So you may eat a burger and then wake up at like one, two in the morning and have to be rushed to the hospital. You can go into anaphylactic shock. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, there was serious. someone recently in Nebraska this summer that had that happen. Is that correct? Or yeah, I mean, that happens a lot. And when I've been to uh, different meetings with entomologists, a lot of entomologists have it because they're out um, doing field work and collecting wow. uh, other things. And they end up collecting, um, collecting uh, or getting bitten by ticks. And um, again, when I said like, it doesn't have to be on you for very long, it's that's, it's in that saliva. Huh. Um, yeah, it, there's a very interesting actually podcast about it's called alpha gal, the, the title, and it was like radio lab. I think it was, oh, it was, cool. it's great. It's we'll a good one. We'll share that. Um, yeah, but I just saw a, a, a thing in the chat that asked if spiders spread any diseases. Yeah. Good question. So here in Nebraska, we have only two medically important spiders and they, they don't, um, they don't, I wouldn't say they spread diseases, but the black widow spider and the brown recluse spider, they have venom that can be very medically important. So brown recluse spider, um, it's going to cause some kind of like, it's got a neurotoxin. So you'd want to go uh, right away to a doctor. Um, and then brown recluse spider, it, their, their venom, if you do get bit, um, in some cases can, um, destroy like flesh in your cells. So, um, Ooh. yeah, it's kind of, it's a cytotoxin. So also not good, but, uh, one way to not get bit by spiders is to just make sure you're not like crushing them or having them up against your skin, boots and shoes, shake those out before you put them on. Um, spiders don't need a blood meal or feed on tissue. So they don't, they're not out to bite us like mosquitoes and ticks are. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have to put that in there. So I feel like we've been hearing a lot. So, so far I'm, I'm hearing West Nile, rabies, um, some other interesting tick-borne. Did we, did we speak about Lyme disease at all as well? Um, we didn't oh. speak about Lyme disease, but that is, that is, that is that's one. prevalent in Nebraska, right? Um, yeah. So in 2019, the black-legged tick was found to be established in Nebraska, where for many years we were thought to be a no Lyme state, which was very difficult. 
Um, as an educator, especially when people would come to me with ticks that were identified that way um, as black-legged ticks, and um, it was kind of dismissed as, oh, maybe it fell off a bird, they're not really oh, wow. here, mm -hmm. or if people um, had very, you know, Lyme disease is, is very, their symptoms are, you know, it could be other things, and so mm -hmm. a lot of doctors would dismiss that and not really give the patients what what they deserve to get, you know, the full right. tests and to look into that. So um, it is something to be aware of here and, you know, always keep your tick. If you are bitten by a tick, yes. remove it safely with a pointy tweezer and don't flush it down the toilet. Don't burn it. Keep it in a bag. Send me a picture. Um, you know, we do a lot of kind of passive surveillance to try to find out what the distribution of, of the tick species are in Nebraska. Um, it's just, it's very important to know too, because if you do end up getting sick, doctors can narrow down what illness you may have. So, you know, people are always thinking about Lyme disease, but we have other ticks that have just as bad, um, Sean just mentioned some viruses. And also we've got Rocky Mountain spotted fever in our dog ticks, and we have, um, you know, star eye in our Lone Star ticks. And so, um, if you're afraid of Lyme disease, but you bring me a tick that's like a seed tick or larval tick, I will tell you what it is and that, you know, it doesn't have disease because it's a larva. So Jody, um, I, I'm a wildlife educator and I yeah. still need to hear this message to keep the tick because just growing up, like everybody probably here, you know, outside all the time, I have ticks, I pull them off. It's, you know, I'm not, you know, but I got really sick last fall and they had to do uh, a full tick-borne panel, like the whole menu. It was a pretty cool thing. And um, and so, but if I had the tick, you know, if that was what mm -hmm. was going on, maybe that would have narrowed it down. It maybe been like a few thousand dollars less for all the different <laughs> tests. So that's a really good, um, good point. So it, that's funny that you say that because my daughter kind of towards springtime, she had a tick attached to the back of her head and it had probably been there probably a good, like it was at least overnight. Um, cause it was, it was attached and I kept the tick Good and job. called the pediatrician and they acted like I was nuts. They were like, no, get rid of it. And I was like, mm -hmm. what if she gets sick? And they were like, it, they literally was like, you're nuts lady. Like throw the tick away. So, um, uh, and she was in, and she ended up fine. She did not get sick or anything, but, um, so you're saying you are the person, um, to contact if that happens again. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. And because I, I think it's really important. And after seeing, you know, being around for a couple of years where no one was taken seriously. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a pr professor um, at UNL on an entomology and we started Tick Tag Go. And it's a, it's a, it's a iNaturalist project to try to map those things. And we want to, I mean, I got so many people sending me ticks, all that information wasn't going anywhere after I identified it. I'm like, I want you to post it somewhere. I want to show, like, let's get a map going and find out um, how to educate people so that they're aware that there are ticks that, um, that exist here. And we need to be careful. We need to, um, check our dogs, check ourselves, check our, check our kids, things like that. And there is a disconnect, like what you were saying, Monica, about, um, you know, our, our doctors, what do they know? And it's, it's hard. I would love to go and give a talk at um, a medical conference or something, I'm, you know, cause we're, we're dealing it from the other side when people bring yeah. this up and I tell them they need to go see a physician, whereas their physician, you know, might say, well, you know, that's not my problem. That, that's a bug, but they need to know, you know, the whole, the whole, how it all yeah, fits. I agree. Together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a holistic thing. It's not separated. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white. I had to, when I, when I was sick last fall, I had to really advocate from not feeling very well, really advocate for a tick panel. It was difficult to even ask, you know, to even, oh, yeah. I guess, I don't know. I guess you were just in Colorado. So right. it's kind of interesting. I've, yeah. I've, I've uh, experienced that disconnect and I hope um, more of like the education and the outreach that like you guys do and everyone's doing is helpful to bring that gap in. Because one of the questions I have for you guys is this is a changing field, just like everything in ecology and our ecosystems, everything is always changing. And are you seeing like, you're, you're, you're speaking to some of the diseases that are in Nebraska right now, but if you were looking at a timeline, are, are you noticing that some diseases are emerging, you know, or going away? Like, what are the trends on a time scale, maybe, if, if you can think of, uh, for some diseases that we have here? 
You know, it, again, this isn't something I study, but I would say absolutely we are seeing more uh, zoonosis in general for two reasons. Uh, number one, we're looking for them and we have better mm -hmm. technology to be able to do so. We can isolate these things and, and actually figure out what they are. The other thing is that as, I, I guess it's two part, that we're getting better at traversing the world very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as the human population increases, we're going more and more into wild areas mm -hmm. where we are exposing ourselves to um, new combinations and wildlife. We're exposing us to them more. They're being exposed to our, um, our cattle, our livestock, and that a lot of times is a vector back and forth. So as humans become more prevalent on this earth, we're getting into the wild more. That creates more opportunity for these zoonoses to become zoonoses, for these diseases to jump to humans. So I would say mm -hmm. we're seeing more. Like an um, increased complexity of systems. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Sean, that reminds me, you're a book person, and I know we've mentioned a few books on here tonight, and I think, Amber, you've read this book, but The Hot Zone, I know it's Favorite. about oh. Ebola virus, but it mentions, like, you know, going into caves and places where humans have not been before, and those diseases emerge, and that's how things often um, find a way to us, so if anyone's interested, The Hot Zone is a, is a really good book about that. Well, and, and that's spillover those two books yes yeah and we'll send those in our in our email to all of you too so you don't have to write it down or anything but that's that's an interesting point monica is that um not only are we, are we going places but it's people going to places on the other side of the world hmm. where they may not have a natural immunity to what's going on there um and and that's you know they they have found there are some people uh, that are actually naturally immune to rabies. It's a small group and and um, I'm not even gonna try to think of it now what country it was, but they found that they have some natural immunity to rabies. And they're, they these people that live in these areas probably have natural immunity to stuff that we don't even know about. But then when oh. someone from across the world comes over and is doing research there and is sitting in a cave full of guano and all of this stuff from, with bats flying around, bat fleas, all the stuff that eats bat guano, you're likely going to get something. Mm. So, and, and you don't have the natural defenses from that because you are a, um, you know, naive host basically in that area. Mm, that's good. That's a good answer. Complexity and increasing human population. Um, uh, I was going to ask, Jody specifically too about I'm just going to ask about you know like as as our winters are getting warmer and what that does to tick populations does mm. that have any kind of indication on disease as well oh I think oh definitely I think when you have I mean a lot of I guess arthropods they need the the environment and the warmth and that governs like how much they you know how much they eat how active they are how many generations they can have what their season is. So the longer, you know, seasons get drawn out, the more generations they can have, the shorter their life cycle, things speed up. And mm. so all you have to do is have that environment and then like a good rain or a flood. And then there's, you know, there's all of the things that can happen in, in that environment to, to have this high density of illness and then close to people. And so, you know, that can happen. And then even with the pandemic, more people started going outside. And they, so mm. af, after that, everyone was like, are there more ticks? And I'm like, well, you're getting outside. Everyone got a dog, you know, <laughs> dogs have to, you know, so like, it's a lot of the things that we do to ourselves, but we need to keep up with the education mm. and the awareness. And I mean, bird flu uh, this year, you know, and we've got so many backyard flocks right now. So people mm. had to be more aware of what they can do to protect themselves because it was no longer what commercial biosecurity um, and you know right. we have 4-H here so we had you know embryology and people showing birds and so all of those things we became aware of of how devastating this could be commercially and for families to mm -hmm. lose their, you know lose their chickens so yeah um you've mentioned uh 
you know, you had West Nile, Jody, and you're because you're out in the field or biologists are out in the field. Sean, I know you've had, you've seen some stuff. Um, <laughs> and one of the questions we had is, and it depends on totally how you much you feel comfortable sharing, but have you experienced some of these zoonotic diseases and what were, you know, your experiences with those? If you would like to share maybe one of them, yeah. um, um, Sean or Jody. I, I likely have had West Nile, um, was probably asymptomatic because I have gotten thousands of, of mosquito bites being out in wetlands sampling for stuff. Um, I've had malaria twice. Um, and now technically I just, I do want to clarify the second time I got it, it was a relapse. Um, so malaria is uh, a parasite mm. uh, spread by mosquitoes. And um, there's actually a latent stage where they um, will rest in your liver, basically, until you're nice and stressed and your immune system is taxed, like maybe when I was getting ready for grad school finals, and oh, then it bursts yeah. out and you have another, um, another infection of it. So, That's but horrible. the second time that I had it, um, my doctor at the time was, uh, she was ex-military and was very used to treating malaria. So she put me on some really high doses of stuff and I haven't had a relapse since. So yay for that. Um, but it, it was um, just in general, it's a really miserable um, experience. The first time I had it for a month before they could figure out what it was. And I lost like 20 pounds and became severely anemic and everything. And I was in the US with great health care and told them I had left the country and all that. But again, unless you really advocate mm. for you need to test me for this, your, your run-of-the-mill doctor is not going to think I should be checking you for malaria. So for zoonotic um, diseases in general, it's, yeah. it's like, yeah. There was another one I was working with, um, bats. And this one's an unusual one. Um, me and a friend of mine, we, a colleague, we were working um, in a barn, in a grain bin in a barn. So you open up this room, um, an old grain room, and it was just wall to wall with bats. And it had a, at least two foot of guano. So you'd open the door and like all this bat poop would come out. We'd go in, we took a few samples, come back out. We weren't wearing the respirators that we should have. Um, and what ended up happening was we got chemically induced pneumonia, uh, <sighs> from basically breathing all the bat urine, uh, that was so concentrated in that room. We broke out within like, uh, half an hour of each other, just coming down with fever and everything, but they didn't know, like our doctors were saying we got probably tick bite and all this stuff. And they finally did x-rays and saw the infection in our lungs and things like that so um but again those are the kind of things that yeah you really have to know what you're dealing with and be able to advocate for please test me for this i was sitting in a room full of bat urine you yeah know, it's one of those things you got to make sure that you're you're very straightforward with mm -hmm. Those are the um, ones I'll share. So mine's <laughs> kind of boring. I was I saw like a like a one of those vans that were like a blood donation van, and I was like, I'm really hungry. I need a cookie. So I went in <laughs> to donate. I just wanted a cookie. I went in. I donated <laughs> blood because I I like doing that. And um, two weeks later, well, I got my cookie. Two weeks later, I got a note, and I thought it was like you know, thank you for donating blood, and it was like, hey, want to let you know you had West Nile virus. And I was like, whoa, they yeah. tested your blood for it. Yeah. Because you can actually pass West Nile virus through like blood transfusion. <gasps> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, is that a standard so, thing when you give blood is they will test for certain things or is that just a yeah, random? They okay. They and they, they ask questions, you know, usually if you're, if you've been at a farm, if you've been out of the country for so long, if you've had tattoos, on different things like that. Um, but they also test your, um, your, you know, they take your temperature, um, mm. because fever will usually indicate, I mean, it indicates, you know, infection of some kind. And I didn't have a fever, I guess that day. Um, and they also, you know, test your iron. So like you have to have high iron, good, to, you know, for you to go. And actually sometimes it's cheaper than like when I had used to have low iron, it was cheaper for me to go donate blood and find out a good iron and you know that I 
So there you go. And, and I got and a you did a cookie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was shocked. And then I actually thought back because I was like, oh, I must have been asymptomatic. But then my husband was like, don't you remember you had this weird rash on your legs and you went to the doctor <laughs> and you were really crabby. And, you know, he was like, remembered. I was like, oh, weird. <laughs> but I guess like I didn't hit the certain symptoms for them to test me for it. Huh. So, yeah, that's not it? a boring story at all. <laughs> just I saying. just wanted a cookie. I just want a cookie. <laughs> but because you were craving that cookie, look at the information you Absolutely. gained. Absolutely. So. I know. Excellent. Adventures. But, but that's, a, that's a really interesting point is that blood transfusions, you know, um, that's another way that these things get passed along. Mm. That's good to know. The result of my Chickborn panel came back with, I have tithers for both West Nile and Dengue. So at some point in my life, I got that too. Um, so now I'll know before I uh, give blood. Maybe I should not. I remember when, when I found out about that, I was so proud of you for like getting all those tests because I have a rap sheet now. I have a wildlife zoonosis rap sheet. It's pretty sweet. I'm going to put it on my my (laughs) street cred. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jody. Um, Let's see. Well, we, we covered so many, so much good information tonight. And one thing, Jody, I heard you say, and I, uh, Monica and I were thinking about this when we were asking these questions, because it's an incredible topic and it's fun to learn about and it's good to be mindful of but we also don't want to like scare people from never going outside like that's the opposite of what Monica and I and I'm sure the Mm -hmm. rest of you Mm -hmm. want um because being outdoors and being connected to nature is a benefit for you and your health also also a benefit for the planet too so what can we do like what would be your kind of like advice to all Nebraskans um we're not fear-mongering you tonight. We're making sure that you're well-educated so you're aware so that you can enjoy enjoy the outdoors safely. What would be some advice that you would give to folks who yeah, want to- Yeah, and, and I have to say first, what I always say, like, if you if you don't have any ticks, then you're not having enough fun. Like, uh, you should great. be out there running through grass with mm-hmm. your dog. Like, you should be having fun, but you just need to do it safely, right? Mm-hmm. So it depends. Like, um, there are clothing, I think, you know, the the type of clothing you're wearing for the type of work or fun you're having out there, what your the conditions are. Permethrin treating clothes, permethrin treated clothes is the best when it comes for ticks. I have not had any problems, but I'm always aware and I'm always stopping and checking for ticks, checking my dog, checking my, you know, my friends, you know, whatever. Um, And I have my container. Um, If you have insect repellent, you know, D is going to D is going to work, but they can crawl off and, and still bite. So you still want to check. So regardless of what you do, still, you know, check for ticks. When you come in from outside, put your, you know, take your clothes off and put them in a hot dryer. If you put them in the, like the laundry hamper, anything that's on there, like ticks can crawl off. So there are things like, you know, to, to let you feel empowered, to be able to go outside, come back um, and, and not have a problem. Also have your pets treated for fleas mm-hmm. and ticks. Because if you, especially if you sleep with your animal, your, your dog, and it's not treated, it's bringing home whatever, and it's coming, you know, it can, it can bite you. So if you have your pet treated, all those ticks will be dead in the, in the pet bed. But um, yeah, I, I would always recommend opting for outside. You just want to make sure to, you know, to do it safely. And, you know, you can't, if in your own, you know, landscape, mosquitoes need water to breed. So, you know, dump standing water and, um, you know, things that can't be dumped like bird baths or ponds, you know, there are uh, organic uh, bacteria, um, BT, uh, they're mosquito dunks for Mm -hmm. that target just uh, the larvae of flies of Mm -hmm. mosquitoes. So it's safe to, for, you know, animals to drink, dogs to drink, birds, those kind of things, but it will prevent mosquitoes from breeding there. So. What were those things called, Judy? Um, the brand, like they're called mosquito dunks. Okay. But it's um, a Bacillus thuringiensis, Israeliensis is the, the subvariant, but they're pretty cheap and it's like it, it works for, I think, like 30 days. So around my house, uh, we've got little kind of drainage things. I'll just, you know, get the bits and put them in there um, every few weeks to make sure I'm not breeding mosquitoes in any of the water that I've got there. Huh, those are interesting. I've never heard those. So, mm-hmm. anything to add on that, Sean, before we do our lightning round? No, but yeah, I would just echo what Jody said, which is 
don't be afraid. You can get out there. And again, as long as you are understanding that you need to remove those things, despite Monica's pediatrician's advice, please keep any ticks that are attached, you know, and, um, you know, don't be afraid, but do be empowered when you go mm -hmm. out to make sure that you're being safe. I like that. Don't be afraid, but be empowered. Love yeah. it. Excellent. All right. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. And usually what we do at this point is we, when people register, they can opt in for a question that they have. So we're going to do a quick lightning round. So we have a couple questions and basically we just try to answer them as quick as possible. Um, luckily, we only have a couple tonight because we only have a couple minutes. But one of them um, was talking about with the expansion of diseases spread by ticks, what is the latest on vaccines and the treatments for humans? Mm, that's good. Um, okay, so I know there used to be a vaccine from Lyme disease, but it was discontinued because there was no like consumer demand for it, mm -hmm. but that there is, um, it was just recently announced that there's like a company, it's like Pfizer and a different company that are in like the phase three of a clinical study for a vaccine against Lyme disease. So, oh, okay. Yeah. But you know, you never know where that's going to go, when that's going to happen. It's got to be safe. So mm -hmm. that's good. And then to keep up with the squirrel question, um, there's something, you know, that we see a lot in urban areas and, you know, 66% of our population in Nebraska is urban. So what diseases can humans um, acquire from squirrels was another question that we had. Um, rabies, tularemia, and there's probably a few others. I mean, obviously there's fleas and things. They can pass ticks along all of that, but I would say rabies and tularemia would probably be your two most medically important to human ones. Awesome. And again, both of those are, are pretty rare. Okay, yeah. All right, well, that's all that we have um, for tonight. Oh, there was one in the chat, I guess, sorry. Let me look really quick. Um, Christine asked, do you think deforestation also is contributing to animal human contacts? That was a question earlier. Oh yeah, um, mm -hmm. absolutely. Again, when you go into these areas, cutting out vegetation, you're um, exposing creatures that may be internal forest um, species and all of a sudden they're on the edge. They're coming in contact with livestock, with humans, with companion animals, and um, that absolutely creates um, opportunities for um, new zoonoses. It's mm. good. good. Yeah, we, we've got like what, urban foxes, turkeys, raccoons, we run into one every night. Turtles, turtle, like snapping turtles especially are really common in Lincoln. I get um, calls every summer that Oh, somebody's pet's walking down the road. And well, how do you know it's a pet? It's ginormous. Well, mm -hmm. it's just a snapping turtle. They can get pretty big. And uh, yeah, we have I, at least a dozen every summer I get uh, snapping turtles moving through um, Lincoln. So. All right. I think I think that's all we have in past eight o'clock. Um, let me look. Yeah. And. I do want to say, you know, we spent an hour on this. We we barely touched. I know. It feels, on I feel like I have. Been, I feel like, like I have more questions. Yeah. Right. Like, like I'm gonna probably thing. come to your office yeah. now to continue this conversation. So. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> Jody, we, give you, you know, I'm glad that we focused on those in Nebraska and we yeah. got into that, and I think we got some great tick information. Mm -hmm. And but man, I feel like there's so much we didn't talk about. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully. It, um, it's, inspired some curiosity in our participants too. And yeah. we'll send them some good resources tomorrow if, so they yes. can look for more stuff that both of you mentioned tonight. And then maybe they'll also just learn more about it on their own. So yeah. And you know what, Amber, we only have two nation nerd nights left. What? It's already September. So we have one in October, okay. uh, um, which 
I don't know if anyone knows, but October is Nebraska Reptile Month. So we're going to continue that mm -hmm. phase there. And we're going to actually going to talk about turtles next time. So Nebraska turtles, we're going to have Dennis Ferraro on um, and a couple other people talking about Nebraska turtles. So please join us. That would be um, October 18th, Tuesday, same time, 7 to 8. And then another event that we have coming up is we have a statewide trivia night um, to kind of go along with our nature nerd. And that will be the following day, the 19th, October 19th. So um, five different locations across the state. We'll have one in Lincoln. Omaha, uh, Wayne, North Platte, and then Scotts Bluff as well. So all on the same night, all during the same time. So um, be on the lookout for that in our emails. And then we'll um, talk about that. But again, thanks, Jody, And thank you, Sean, for joining us yeah. tonight, talking about uh, zoonotic diseases and all that great information that you had to share with us. So thanks thank for you. empowering everybody with the information <laughs> tonight. I like that a lot. Thanks, thanks for great. having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night, everyone.